Greetings, listeners. This is another one of those episodes where if you're in the car with virgin ears or at work, you may not want to continue listening until you have headphones in. This is a NSFW episode, and we hope you enjoy. Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. Elizabeth, when you think of aphrodisiacs, what are the first foods that come to your mind? Um, wine, oysters, chocolate, strawberries, champagne. Strawberries. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So a great list. <laughs> and I'm very glad that you said chocolate because that is very important to my setup. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> of the many very weird things that are supposed to get you horny, chocolate is unequivocally the best, and I dare you to change my mind. Uh. <laughs> Surprisingly, it's actually really hard to find histories of chocolate as aphrodisiac. Um, if you go to a library website and search for chocolate aphrodisiac history, you'll get overwhelmed by a bunch of modern medical studies rather than histories. It's much easier to find distinct histories of aphrodisiacs and distinct histories of chocolate and then look where the two overlap. Um, the disconnect, I think, is because the history of aphrodisiacs is tied specifically to early modern European medicine and developed out of earlier traditions of comestible sex remedies that could be easily obtained by anyone in early modern Europe. Uh, cacao, from which Spanish chocolate was derived in the 16th century, is native, of course, to Mesoamerica. Among the Maya, the Mexica, and other Central American peoples, cacao was used for ritual, religious, and medicinal purposes. In some places, it was even used as currency. <laughs> when the Spanish conquered Mesoamerica, they conquered cacao. Uh, mixing the bitter cacao seeds with sugar and other spices, spices that were often also obtained through European conquest, the Spanish created a commodity that stimulated the European comestible market. But its luxuriousness grew first out of its expensiveness and rarity in early modern Europe. So the inaccessibility of chocolate to most early modern Europeans meant that it has not really featured strongly in the longer history of European aphrodisiacs specifically. Um, but the story of the ways that Europeans adopted the bittersweet Central American drink as a sex remedy says a great deal about the history of sexuality, medicine, gender, economics, race, and imperialism. I'm Avril Earls. And I'm Elizabeth Garner Meserich. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. <laughs> We want to give a big thank you to our Patreon supporters. We have a couple of new folks at our auger and excavator levels. Edward, Denise, and Eric, welcome. Thank you for supporting us. And to each of our patrons, but especially Iris, Maggie, Danielle, Peggy, Christopher, Colin, Lauren, Maddie, and Susan, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You make this show possible. Take a sleepy French village with lots of pent-up sexual yearnings and unfulfilled romances, mix in a bold, single mother and entrepreneur of not totally white heritage, and then sprinkle in a few Roma nomads on riverboats, and you've got the lusty, bittersweet setting for the acclaimed 1999 novel, and then 2000 film, Chocolat. First, if you haven't seen it, get yourself an HBO Max subscription, or rent it on YouTube immediately. I guess you probably could also read the book, but then you'd miss the delightful performances of Juliette Binoche, Judy Dench, Alfred Molina, and Carrie Ann Moss. And yeah, sure, Johnny Depp's ugh, in it too. <laughs> I personally have seen this film approximately one million times. I bought the DVD 
uh, from a blockbuster sale nice. when I was a sophomore in college. Nice. I probably watched it every week of undergrad. Um, what can I say? I guess I used to be a romantic. Used to be. What happened to you? My heart froze over. It did. Rom-com sentimentalities aside, this film actually provides convenient ties to bind together today's story. If you're unfamiliar with the plot, here it is in three sentences. An independent woman who wears colorful clothes and makes decadent and insightful chocolate moves to a French town right at the beginning of Lent with her illegitimate daughter, and she opens up a chocolate shop. She wages a war of wills with the local Comte, whose wife has left him, though he hasn't told anyone, and who resents the chocolatier for all that it represents, a headstrong woman, sexual freedom, and self-enjoyment, which apparently spits in the face of the Catholic Church. The chocolatier has an affair with, with a handsome Roma man, helps the town folk rekindle their sex lives with aphrodisiac chocolate remedies, empowers women to live the lives they want to live and escape from abusive relationships, and eventually has to choose whether to flee the mounting conflict with the comp or set down roots, which is exactly, it turns out, what she and her daughter need. It's a very long three sentences, and yet... You need it for this film. Okay. <laughs> you don't mention that her hair is amazing. I just remember watching this movie and thinking, oh my God, her hair is gorgeous in this movie. She did have really cute hair. She did. I like Juliette Binoche. Um, this film is, is certainly not without its flaws, uh, that the director sort of really leans into the sexualization and eroticization of the only fully non-white character in the entire film, beyond uh, South American mother. Um, I think her name is Chitza, and it, I don't actually think they ever say where specifically she was supposed to be from, just that she is blown about by the North Wind. Mm. All that is pretty problematic. Um, and we don't even have time today to get into why Johnny Depp decided that Roma, or, you know, or ethnic gypsy, right, meant extra tanned, because how else would one communicate ethnic difference? <laughs> But these issues aside, Chocolat is actually a really useful window for looking at this history. For example, it captures European imperialism in little vignettes, like when Vianne's white French father captures, if fleetingly, her Mesoamerican mother, or when the symbolically, if not actually, brown romantic riverboat traders roll into town with their wares and are harassed and even attacked by those most vested in maintaining the patriarchal and white supremacist norms. There's also the central commodity of the film, the chocolat, which is presented in an almost religious way to rival the Christian norms of the town. Vian gives folk rem medical remedies to various customers, including a bag of chocolates that most definitely were intended to give uh, the husband his mojo back um, because he eats a few sweets, goes in search of his wife, finds her kneeling on the floor, scrubbing away her backside, swaying alluringly, and the hot sex that will follow is implied by his flushed and lustful stare. But... Her unregulated disbursement of chocolate cures turns kind of ugly when she gives a hot, sweetened chocolate drink to an older woman who is who asks for it whenever she visits the shop. While the older woman's death um, as a result of drinking this chocolate is presented as having been on her own terms, I can't help but contemplate the meaning behind the use of the original chocolate, which in Mesoamerica always came in drink form to be bastardized though it was by Europeans with added sugar and milk and any number of things but how that then is the the killer of this you know like of, of Dame Judy Dench mm. and while chocolat is far from the only pop culture reference in which chocolate is linked to its aphrodisiac reputation it is one of the only ones that we could think of that even attempts to reach out, however clumsily, for those Mesoamerican roots. If you, listener, can think of any examples, send us a tweet, post on our Facebook page, or send us an email at hello at digpodcast.org, um, because we'd love to hear from you, as always, but we're genuinely curious if and where you've encountered the integration of Mesoamerican culture or heritage into the use of chocolate as a sex remedy. Cacao, um, which is a foamy bitter beverage made from the seeds of cacao pods 
reached its height of importance in Mesoamerican rituals, uh, trade, medicine, as currency and, and consumption in the classic period of Mesoamerican history. Um, so about 300 to 950 CE and continued to be significant up through the post-classic period when the Spanish conquistadors arrived um, in, you know, the so the post-classic period is 950 to 1520. And that's around the time that like the Aztecs rose to prominence um, before the Spanish just decimated them. Much about cacao is debated among scholars from various disciplines who disagree on everything from the origin of the word, um, how the tree itself got to Mesoamerica because it's actually native to South America, whether it was domestication or wild travel on, you know, like the, the wings or the feet of the birds and the monkeys, um, and exactly how the seeds were used in ancient Mayan times. Were beverages made from the pulp of the pods or only from the seeds, for example? Um, and this is just among other things. Cacao, however, likely comes from the Maya term caca, which, uh, but as Cameron, uh, historian Cameron McNeil notes, that's not a fact, it's just a hypothesis. What we do know is that the trees that grow the cacao pods are native to South America. The species of tree the Mesoamericans preferred would later be called Theosperma cacao, or food of the gods, by the famous Swedish scientist Carl Linnaeus in 1753. The flowers grow directly on the trunk in the branches. Oh, just like that hideous painting that we did for our first paint night on oh my gosh. Which, the beginning of pandemic. Our drink and paint pandemic. Oh my god. I joke. That one was so hard. I hate <laughs> painting birds. Anyway, anyway, go on. The tree itself thrives in river valleys with humid and hot climates. From sources like the Florentine Codex and Indigenous Art and Artifacts, uh, modern historians and archaeologists have been able to discern that cacao had immense significance in Mesoamerican culture. In classic Mesoamerica, again from around 600 to 950 CE, cacao and blood were closely linked. Uh, Mesoamericans often colored cacao beverages red with annatto seeds. And scholar Rosemary Joyce suggests that cacao's role in marriage ceremonies signified the mixing of bloodlines because you'd like mix the the drink back and forth and then you'd you you'd drink it um to celebrate your your marriage ceramics and statuary from this period depict cacao pods being sacrificed like human hearts like in you know paintings or whatever they're like holding up a cacao pod and they're stabbing it and it's like bleeding all over um and bleeding cacao, cacao pods are also found throughout the mishtek uh, codices and cacao necklaces have been identified draped around the necks of figurines representing captives. In Mexico, at least, cacao in the post-classic period, so 900 to 1520 CE, was reserved for the elite, warriors, and merchants. According to one story collected in the Florentine Codex, the ethnography of 18th century Mesoamericans compiled by Spanish Franciscan friar Bernardino de Sahagún. Quote, if he drank it were a common person, it was taken as a bad omen. And in times past, only the ruler drank it, or a great warrior, or a commanding general. If perhaps two or three lived in wealth, they drank it. Although also it was hard to come by. They drank a limited amount of cacao for it was not drunk unthinkingly, end quote. Cameron McNeil suggests that though cacao was more readily available to elites and according to some sources was supposed to be limited to the warriors and nobility, she suggests that the archaeological and Spanish sources indicate that cacao was still used by common folk throughout Mesoamerica. But because it was so valuable, its significance was heightened for commoners because it was only set aside for them at feasts, for religious ceremonies, for marriages, and things like that. The traditional preparation of cacao was largely women's work, although women were also excluded from the like sacred spaces um, of most Mesoamerican uh, religious practices. Um, but anyway, the pods would be gathered from the cacao tree and then uh, maybe fermented in pods for a day or more, um, sort of like dried in the sun. And then women would prepare them in special kitchens, grinding up the seeds, sometimes with the pods and sometimes without. Uh, chocolate was most commonly prepared as a beverage. Um, cacao powder or paste cakes were mixed with water, sometimes also with spices or ground maize or corn. 
Uh, some groups used a special like stirring stick to froth it up, and others prepared the froth by pouring the liquid mixture back and forth between two containers. Um, in both cases, the drink pr- produced was like bitter and bubbly. It actually sounds really good. Hernan Cortez, the conquistador who decimated the Aztecs and claimed Mesoamerica for Spain, brought the first cacao beans back to Europe in 1525, presenting them to Charles V. Europeans were introduced to chocolate as an instrument of sexual arousal from the beginning. Bernal Diaz del Castillo, a conquistador who was present at some of the meetings between Cortez and Moctezuma, the last Aztec emperor, wrote that, quote, they brought Cortez some cups of fine gold with a certain drink made of cacao, which they said was for success with women. But I saw that they brought more than 50 great jars of good cacao with its foam, and he drank of that, and the women served him drink very respectfully. According to Donatella Lippi, at first, because the chocolate drink was known to be an aphrodisiac and could even induce euphoric-like states, the Catholic Church decided it was an illicit substance to be avoided, for example, during Lent. But by 1662, Cardinal Brancaccio declared that liquidium non frangit jejunum, uh, drinking li- cho- liquid chocolate does not constitute breaking in fast. And since chocolate was still consumed almost exclusively as a beverage until well into the 18th century, um, it was then acceptable. But the 1669 decision wasn't the be-all end-all of this conversation um, for sort of maybe obvious reasons because the chocolate was had these side effects, much like coffee or wine. Uh, it was sort of on this weird liminal state between what was acceptable for um, people to imbibe during events like Lent where you're supposed to be denying yourself certain things um, right. like food. Uh, Manuel Aguilar Moreno's work on cacao in colonial Mexico reveals that this conversation continued well into the mid-18th century. One Italian bishop wrote a thorough pontification about whether or not consuming chocolate during Lent broke the fast. Though ultimately that bishop agreed that chocolate was like wine, which was permitted, um, like the stuffy Comte Reynaud in Chocolat, for some actual Catholic officials, uh, chocolate, chocolate was a temptation. One one that could lead one to sinfulness or perhaps uh, bring light to the sinfulness that was already there. Aguilar Moreno notes that several priests stationed in Mesoamerica also made a killing by amassing wealth through cacao seeds from the collection plates. So, you know, there's all kinds of uh, hypocrisies right. buried or tied up in, in this situation. Cacao pods and chocolate, the frothy, bitter drink preferred by the Mexica, Maya, and other Central Americans, have a long history of medicinal use. The earliest records include the 1552 Barianus Manuscript, which was written by an Aztec physician, Martinez de la Cruz, an 18th century Florentine codex. According to Donatella Lippi, De La Cruz listed a number of ailments that cacao and its derivatives were known to treat, including, quote, angina, constipation, dental tartar, uh, dysentery, dyspepsia, indigestion, weariness, gout, hemorrhoids. Sarah Goon's Florentine Codex spends more time describing the process of making the cacao beverage than on its medicinal properties, though he does suggest that the beverage could be invigorating, but must not be overused. In Book 11 of the Florentine Codex, Sahagun wrote, quote, This cacao, when much is drunk, when much is consumed, especially that which is green, which is tender, makes one drunk takes effect on one, makes one dizzy, confuses one, makes one sick, deranges one. When an ordinary amount is drunk, it gladdens one, refreshes one, consoles one, invigorates one. Thus it is said, I take cacao, I wet my lips, I refresh myself. Curiously, neither person dwelled on the cacao's use as a sex remedy. Conversely, other European medicinal texts written between the Barianus and the Florentine manuscripts spent considerable time invoking the arousing qualities of the cacao products. It doesn't seem that far-fetched to imagine that chocolate's sexy reputation in Europe 
has as much to do with European eroticization of the mysterious Central American other as its actual stimulating properties. And so we circle back around to the parallels of this story with Chocolat. Uh, European hangups about sex and deep-seated anxiety about one's inability to perform or conceive are very much present in the fictional French townsfolk of Chocolat. In early modern Western European culture, there was a lot riding on sex, reproduction, and even pleasure. It should be no surprise then that medical experts and ordinary people alike developed an extensive list of remedies to deal with impotence and infertility. Aphrodisiac is a European term for a comestible or a consumable home remedy for infertility, impotence, or some other sexual affliction. There are histories of aphrodisiacs, though not a lot of them. Angus McLaren discusses aphrodisiac extensively in a couple of his histories of early modern Europe, sex and medicine. And Jennifer Evans has a great book that focuses on the use of aphrodisiacs in early modern England. If you're interested in McLaren's work, Marissa did a great episode on impotence a little while ago that will be of interest to you. Now, of course, the idea that you can ingest certain foods or beverages to stimulate sexual arousal is by no means new, nor specific to Europe. Sexual dysfunction, uh, as Marissa discussed at length in her episode on impotence, has a history of being really scary to people. As historian Jennifer Evans points out, in early modern England and most Christian nations at the same time, fertility was central to marriages, morally in that you were only really supposed to be boning in order to conceive babies, but also legally in that a woman could sue for divorce or annul a marriage if her husband failed to perform his marital duties and vice versa, right? Whether the cause may be chalked up to witchcraft or imbalanced humors, early modern Europeans, like modern Europeans and, and heck folks today went to some extreme lengths to try to remedy a flaccid penis or a barren womb. In the early 17th century, for example, the fourth Duke of Mantua and Monferrato sent an apothecary by the name of Evangelista Marcombruno on a journey around the world to try to find a miracle cure for the Duke's erectile dysfunction. Poor Marco Bruno searched for four years, going from Barcelona to Madrid, Segovia, Seville, and Cadiz, and then throughout the New World, including Cartagena, Portobello, Panama, and Namanta in Ecuador, Callejo, Lima, Cusco, and Potosi in Peru, and, uh, and La Paz in Bolivia. He was searching for new herbal and potential pharmaceutical compounds to bring back to his employer. Most early modern Europeans didn't have access to the resources of the Duke uh, of Mantua and had to make do with more readily available remedies like the aphrodisiac edibles. Kind of like uh, CBD edibles. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, and various other home remedies, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, not extensively, but a little bit. Uh, according to Evans, the language surrounding reproduction and sexual health in early modern England shifted slightly between the 17th and 18th centuries. Up until that point, the classic Greek texts on medicine had generally been translated into Latin. So Galenic humoral medicine and theories of the body were still the norm, but the, the language that physicians and medical scholars used was generally in Latin. So when discussing sex, you'll often see venery in pre-17th century texts, venery uh, being in this case a synonym for sexual intercourse, as in, quote, when the husband cometh into his wife's chamber, he must entertain her with all kind of dalliance, wanton behavior, and allurements to venery. But if he perceive her to be slow and more cold, he must cherish, embrace, and tickle her, and shall not abruptly, the nerves being suddenly distended, break into the field of nature, but sh rather shall creep in by little and little intermixing more wanton kisses with wanton words and speeches, handling her secret parts and dugs that she may take fire and be inflamed to venery. So notes the 16th century surgeon Ambrose Perry. Mm. Secret parts and dugs. Ah, yes, the secret parts and dugs, dugs. As, one, as one does. It's me and the dugs. 
By the 18th century, Evans argues, there was a shift in the etymology of medical terminology. Aphrodisiac entered the English lexicon in the 17th century in the works of, for example, Swiss physician Theophile Bonnet, 1684, uh, Welsh physician John Jones in 1701, and English surgeon John Martin in 1709. For whatever reason, the original Greek of the Galenic and other classical medical treatises were again popularized. Aphrodisiac is a term derived from Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. Venereal, as in venereal disease, or venery, more broadly, comes from Venus, which was the Roman name for Aphrodite. There were many foods common in early modern Europe that were considered aphrodisiacs. Galenic humoral theory recommended that the affected, those who are unable to conceive, get it up, or whatever, um, that they consume foods that resembled sex organs. And that was a good bet, right? So for penises, it was like eggplants and broad beans and other phallic-shaped goods. Um, Early modern physicians and apothecaries also had their male customers eat pigeon, cock, pig, and the meats of other lascivious creatures. That's kind of funny because, like, the eggplant image on when you're texting uh the emoji is, that's how you yeah, know that's how Egg you know and peach it's gonna get down yep uh most of these aphrodisical foods were common and commonly available everything from veal new laid eggs oysters crab prawns wine and various beverages like coddles which was an eggnog type drink or posset a milk and wine drink But some aphrodisiacs were luxury comestibles, things attributed power in large part because of their rarity or expense. Chocolate was introduced to Europe by the Spanish as early as the 16th century. Evans's book on aphrodisiacs, uh, though focused on early modern England specifically, makes a pretty compelling case for the commonness of aphrodisiacs in early modern culture. She argues that by the 18th century, sexual appetite was considered essential to a healthy marriage and successful procreation. This common knowledge was due in large part to both the evolving opinions of medical experts and the growing influence of Protestantism, which privileged marriage over celibacy. So um, aphrodisiacs, foods and comestibles that stimulated arousal, were really widespread in the early modern period and sort of part of everyday life. Early modern Europeans sought out remedies for all kinds of illnesses, infertility, impotence, but also gout, intestinal issues, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, from all kinds of places, including med- uh, trees and manuscripts, friends and relatives, and a range of medical practitioners, like barber surgeons, uh, physicians, midwives, and apothecaries. Aphrodisiacs were supposed to increase fertility, curing impotence in men and barrenness in women, and help produce stronger offspring by helping women climax. Certainly, by the 18th century, sexual pleasure was widely understood to be an important part of conception, and people wanted to have stronger offspring reflective of anxiety around the high infant mortality rate in the early modern period. Medicinal knowledge from the Americas took decades to penetrate Mm. Europe. (laughs) Sorry. Um, I I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. You had to slip it in there. Bazinga. Bazinga. Anyway. uh, (laughs) Uh, Anyway, even though kings and dukes, you know, like uh, the Duke of Mantua, sent their physicians to the Americas specifically to search for remedies. But Europeans were were like reluctant to try many of the commodities that were native to the Americas. Um, You're probably familiar with the range of goods that the indigenous Americans introduced to the Europeans. Um, Tobacco, obviously, the three sisters of beans, squash and corn pineapple and peanuts, potatoes, tomatoes, and of course, cacao were all either given as gifts by the Americans or taken as plunder by the Europeans. Some of these things caught on quickly as European consumer goods, particularly tobacco. Um, For some of the other edibles, it took some expert marketing and repackaging to convince European consumers to ingest the products of the new world. 
uh, for example, it took um, centuries for Europeans to feed potatoes to anyone other than their livestock. And the ultimate association with the poor rural populations of Russia and Ireland didn't give the Spud a particularly uh, cool guy brand. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although today we all love our taters. Oh, yes. In Mesoamerica, chocolate was consumed as a very bitter, frothy drink, generally unsweetened, except for those regions which crushed up the seeds with the with the sweet pod pulp. Um, chocolate didn't really catch on in Europe until people started experimenting with additives like milk, sugar, vanilla, cinnamon, chilies, and other spices. Uh, the Jesuit Jose de Acosta, writing in 1590, commented on just how gross he thought chocolate was in its traditional form. He said, quote, The main benefit of this cacao is a beverage which they make called chocolate, which is a strange thing valued in that country. It disgusts those who are not used to it, for it has a foam on top or a scum-like bubbling. It is a valued drink which the Indians offer to the lords who come or pass through their lands. And the Spanish men, even more than the Spanish women, are addicted to black chocolate. The Spanish rebranded the traditional cacao beverage consumed by Mesoamericans, uh, mixing it with sugar and various spices like chilies, cinnamon, or anise, which I think is hilarious that like nowadays, if the cool thing is to, to get like cayenne chocolate, like that's something mm -hmm. new, you know, mm -hmm. but really mm -hmm. it's very, very old. Um, by the early 17th century, Spain was producing its version of chocolate for distribution to its own citizens and other Europeans. Its popularization was launched by medical treaties on the benefits of chocolate by experts like the Spanish physician Antonio Colmenero of Ledesma, who wrote chocolate or an Indian drink. As Kate Loveland notes, the 1640s and 1650s were a crucial time for marketing chocolate to the British, French, and other Europeans. The famous captain, James Wadworth, prepared an appended and translated edition of chocolate or an Indian drink for English readers to sell the beverage. According to Wadsworth, chocolate is an Indian word compounded of ate, as some say, or as others, atle, which in the Mexican language signifieth water and Chaco, the noise that the water wherein the chocolate is put maketh when it is stirred in a cup until it bubble and rise unto a froth, end quote. Like the Duke of Mantua several decades later, King Philip II of Spain sent his royal physicians to the Americas in search of information about Mesoamerican medicinal treatments and herbs. But he was certainly not the last. For 300 years after those early investigations of chocolate and its uses, Europeans regularly returned to the cacao tree as both a valuable commodity and a potential treatment for all kinds of illnesses, including by the 17th century impotence. In his 1652 introduction, Wadsworth promised readers that chocolate was truly something special. He said, quote, It hath been universally sought for and thirsted after by people of all degrees, especially those of the female sex, either for the pleasure therein naturally residing it cure and divert diseases, or else some defects of nature wherein it challenges a special prerogative above all other medicines whatsoever. The virtues thereof are no less various than admirable, for besides that it preserves health and makes such as drink it often fat and corpulent, fair and amiable, it vehemently incites to Venus and causeth conception in women hastens and facilitates their delivery. It is an excellent help to digestion. It cures consumptions and the coughs of the lung and the new disease or plague of the guts and other fluxes, the green sickness, jaundice, and all manner of inflammations, opulations, and obstructions. It quite takes away the morphew, cleanses the teeth, and sweetens the breath, provokes urine, cures the stone, and strangery expels poison and preserves from all infectious diseases. Good Lord, it does it all. It does it all. It's the miracle cure. <laughs> so, and so there it is, one of the earliest records in the English language identifying the confection of chocolate as an aphrodisiac. But Wadsworth, of course, was trying uh, in this introduction to sell a product. According to historian Kate Loveman, 
uh, we must not take Wadsworth at his word, even in his assertion that the drink was, quote, thirsted after by people of all degrees. For in fact, chocolate was not well known in England at mid-century. It wasn't until the 1690s that England had its first chocolate house. Similarly, R. Brooks translated a French medical treatise on the health benefits of chocolate in 1725. The Natural History of Chocolate outlines how and where cacao is harvested, identifies which ailments might be treated by chocolate, and seeks to place chocolate firmly in the recognizable language of the Galenic humoral theory of medicine, but does not make any connections to any associations with Venus the way that Wadsworth did. Um, Similarly, Henry Stubb, Charles II of England's doctor, personal physician, wrote in his monograph in 1662 that chocolate was helpful as an expectorant, a diuretic, and an aphrodisiac. Between the 17th and the 19th centuries, an extraordinary number of medical treaties like these were written by Europeans. Not all agreed on chocolate's usefulness or its appropriate application, but that's of course to be expected. While the Enlightenment brought more innovation in testing and observation and the scientific method, medical expertise was only gradually regulated over the course of the 18th century. One physician might reject chocolate as too stimulating, likely to overwork the heart, while others lauded its stimulating properties. Not all agreed that it was a viable aphrodisiac, and one physician even endorsed it simply because it tasted good, which is nice for the patient, but does not inspire confidence. In the 17th and 18th century, various medical texts made recommendations both for and against the medicinal use of chocolate. In, the seven, in 17th century Europe, um, chocolate was a, a luxury item. Unlike the broader spectrum of aphrodisiacs, it was not readily accessible to all English folks or, or most other Europeans. Um, while chocolate wasn't necessarily a go-to aphrodisiac among Europeans for the first century of its introduction to Europe, um, that place was, uh, of honor was left to eggs and oysters and phallic vegetables, it did gain a reputation as both a sexually exciting luxury comestible and a sex cure for the elite. In the 17th century, um, you likely wouldn't get a chocolate prescription from your local witch, but that didn't stop European chocolatiers from encouraging the publication of a range of medical treatises to sell chocolate as a cure for all kinds of ailments, including infertility. By the end of the 18th century, chocolate was shilled as a sweet cure-all. And there's a longer history here um, of quacks and snake oil vendors and how that fits into the eventual regulation and standardization and gendered uh, narrowing, I don't know, professionalization of medicine, but that's something we'll have to leave for another day. Chocolat got the woman-centered and Mesoamerican practice of chocolate making right. The way that cacao was prepared and served was ritualized and gendered. According to Sahagun's Florentine Codex, women did the mixing of the beverage, pouring vessels of cacao back and forth to create a foam, rather than whipping it up with a stick or an other instrument. Like sex remedies in early modern Europe, scholars believe that the cacao pod was more closely associated with women than men because the pod resembled a vagina. According to Cameron McNeil, quote, although both female and male ancestors are depicted reborn as cacao trees, portrayals of female figures with cacao growing from their bodies are more common than similar representations of males. For Vienne and her mother, Chitza, to hold the secrets of chocolate making fits well with the mythologies and beliefs surrounding Mesoamerican preparation and consumption of cacao. So too does this charming film get the modern reputation of chocolate right. And by the beginning of the 19th century, the marketing campaign to sell sweet and chocolate as a remedy may have worked too well because the medical benefits of the cacao plant were quickly overtaken by their sweetened side effects. The things that made it palatable to Europeans, uh, like milk, sugar, and spices, would also become associated with negative long-term health effects. When Judy Dench's character dies from diabetes, a sugar overload hastened by Vian's sweet treats, 
It's reminiscent of the tainted reputation that chocolate accrued over the last two centuries. While it may have continued to stimulate the libido, it was also linked to dental decay, obesity, and a range of other health problems. And it's really only very recently that Europeans and Americans have even tried to rehabilitate the image of chocolate, retreating uh, to higher cocoa content dark chocolates with lower added sugar and little to no milk, solids, and fats. Today, the health benefits of chocolate have returned to the public lexicon, but without the sort of uh, gusto that they did between the 16th and 18th centuries. Of course, in Mesoamerica, cacao in its unadulterated form continues to hold significance today, though the Spanish decimated and pushed underground much of the traditional religious and spiritual practices when they conquered Mesoamerica, some of the cacao-based rituals of Mesoamerican religion were preserved in syncretic Christianity, a mix of traditional indigenous religious symbols embedded in the superstructure of Catholicism. Today, cacao is still considered and made as offering in the surviving syncretic elements of Mesoamerican Christianity, but colonialism drastically changed the accessibility, meaning, and value of cacao from the colonial period on. The conquistadors decimated cacao's users through the introduction of deadly diseases, forced religious conversions, and the conquest of the cacao-producing lands. In a lot of ways, chocolat is just a sweet reflection of life, love, and chocolate. But calling back to the Mesoamerican roots of chocolate sets it apart from the dozens, perhaps hundreds, of other pop cultural references to chocolate as an aphrodisiac. It takes a moment, just a moment, but a moment nonetheless to touch on the longer, bitterer journey of chocolate from Mesoamerica to Europe. If you let it, it, it will make you think about how otherness and the exotic other are embedded in the long histories of imperialism, but also in the faces and structure of Hollywood and the pop cultural reference points that shape how we see the world. But now I think I'm probably getting a little too deep in the theory. So instead, let's all break now. Go turn on Chocolat for a first time watch or rewatch. Make ourselves a cup of hot chocolate and be thankful that it's the sweet kind, while also reflecting on its longer history as a product of violent imperialism and as an aphrodisiac. Thanks so much for listening. Remember to um, hit that subscribe button. And if you liked this podcast, leave us a five-star review because it helps us um, or it helps new listeners find our podcast. And you can always uh, shoot us a message about your knowledge about where chocolate shows up as an aphrodisiac and also connects to its Mesoamerican roots. Uh, on Twitter, we're at dig underscore history. On Facebook and our Facebook, uh, Dig Pod Squad. Um, or just shoot us an email. And uh, thanks for listening. Bye. Stay sweet. This podcast was produced by the historians of DIG, Elizabeth garner Masaryk, Sarah Hanley-Cousins, Marissa Rhodes, and me, Averill Earls. Thanks for listening. Comte. Comte. Right? Comte. 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 Sorry. Badenaeus manuscript? Badenaeus? Huh? Ooh. Badi- Badi- anus. Badi- anus? Okay. <laughs> no, don't say anus. Oh Betty anus. Body anus. Yes. Body anus. Yeah. There we go. Okay. We like that. That sounds better. What does comest- comestible mean? It means that you ingest it. I have never heard that word in my leaf wife wolf. 50 great jars. Great jars. Of- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that one was too funny. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Angus McGeeran, my guy, how do you say that? Angus McLaren. Huh? Angus McLaren. Constipation, dental tartar. Is it tartar? Tartar. Okay. I didn't know tartar was spelled that way. I like that one. Did you learn anything or did you know all these things? I feel like. Oh, I, did, I didn't know any okay, of this. Good. Poor Marco Bruno. How did I say it first? Oh, well, you said it right. Marco Bruno. some of that taint. <laughs> is that is that how you're ending that paragraph? 
NHA